If you were shocked by Tory MP Nusrat Ghani's allegation that she was sacked as a minister for her Muslimness, then prepare to be properly shaken. Because if true, the claim is only the latest in a long history of Islamophobia within the Conservative Party. We all remember Boris Johnson's Telegraph article from 2018 when he wrote of Muslim women, It is absolutely ridiculous that people should choose to go around looking like letterboxes. If a constituent came to my MP's surgery with her face obscured, I should feel fully entitled, like Jack Straw, to ask her to remove it so that I could talk to her properly. If a female student turned up at school or at a university lecture looking like a bank robber, then ditto. Letterboxes and bank robbers. The Press Gazette reported that anti-Muslim incidents increased 375% in the week following publication of that piece. 58% of those incidents involved visibly Muslim women who wore a face veil, and 42% of them directly referenced Boris Johnson or the language used in that column. But Johnson is not the only Conservative to have traded in Islamophobic tropes. In the 2016 election campaign for Mayor of London, Tory candidate Zach Goldsmith was running against Labour's Sadiq Khan. As the campaign heated up, he wrote this article in the Daily Mail, which was widely condemned for attempting to pander to anti-Muslim sentiment. The headline read, On Thursday, are we really going to hand the world's greatest city to a Labour party that thinks terrorists are its Friends, it has a picture there of a terrorist attack in in London. Obviously, a horrible association which is being made. In other parts of the Conservative Party, MP Bob Blackman is another Tory politician with a long history of Islamophobia. In February 2016, Blackman retweeted this post by far right activist Tommy Robinson. I won't read it out, but it clearly implies that Muslims are murderous. A year later, Blackman hosted Tapam Ghosh, an anti-Muslim extremist at the House of Commons. Ghosh has called for the UN to control the Muslim birth rate and has appeared on Tommy Robinson's YouTube channel. Outside Westminster in 2019, it emerged that 14 Tory party members had been suspended for posting racist or Islamophobic material on social media. Baroness Varsi, who was a Tory minister between 2010 and 2014, has long tried to address Islamophobia in the party. On the question of an internal inquiry, she told The World at One, We have a deep-rooted problem of anti-Muslim comments, Islamophobic comments, racist comments that have been made right from the top, from MPs through to councillors, council candidates, members, linked groups. I think it has now gone beyond that and we need an independent inquiry. The Equality and Human Rights Commission was called on to launch an inquiry into Islamophobia in the Conservative Party at the same time as it was undertaking an investigation into anti-Semitism In the Labour Party, by March 2020, the Muslim Council of Britain had submitted a dossier of 300 allegations of Islamophobia to the EHRC. These included cases involving free Tory MPs. Sally Ann Hart shared an article on Facebook by US anti-Islam activist Sherry Behrens, describing it as an affecting read. In the post, Behrens described the Women's March against Trump as having been hijacked by the Muslim Brotherhood in order to promote the Muslim agenda. Hart was investigated and cleared by the Tory party. Anthony Brown, MP for South Cambridgeshire, questioned the loyalty of British Muslims in his book, Do We Need Mass Immigration? Writing about Muslim leaders who questioned whether the Iraq war could cause social unrest in the UK, he wrote, Whatever the merits or demerits of war on Iraq, it is hardly a national strength to have a large minority with such divided loyalties during war. And Carl McCartney MP for Lincoln retweeted anti-Muslim and anti-Semitic material posted by Tommy Robinson and Katie Hopkins. Both Brown and McCartney apologised. Of course, there is also a government minister with a history of retweeting fascists and spreading Islamophobic hate. Of course, I'm talking about Culture Secretary Nadine Dorries. These examples are all between 2017 and 2018. Defending Johnson's Telegraph article on talk radio, she said, I'm disappointed Boris didn't go further. He could have called for a ban on the burqa and the release of Muslim women segregated in society. Many of these women are not free to choose their own husbands. This tweet um, targeted Sadiq Khan, but has nothing to do with what he said. So you can see here she's quote tweeted Sadiq Khan, how about it's time to act on sex abusing grooming gangs 
instead. Completely irrelevant to what Sadiq Khan has tweeted there. So we have to wonder why she sent it. Clearly, to my mind, that's completely Islamophobic about the, the most high profile Muslim politician in the country. Doris has also quote tweeted a nonsense story about Muslims claiming benefits for multiple wives. Ministers, are you having a laugh? Responding to someone with all of these union jacks sharing this, this nonsense story. And Nadine Doris has also retweeted Tommy Robinson. Still, despite all of this evidence and more, the EHRC decided in May 2020 not to investigate the Tory party. A few months later, it emerged that two former EHRC commissioners had not been reappointed to the commission because they were, in their words, too loud and vocal about issues of race. Baroness Maral Hussain Eki was then the only Muslim on the commission and Lord Simon Woolley, who was the only black commissioner, both lost their jobs in 2012. On Islamophobia in the Tory party, Hussain Eki said, I don't think Islamophobia or anti-Muslim hate is taken seriously. And at the time of the EHRC decision in 2020, there were still no black or Muslim commissioners. For their part in 2021, the Conservative Party published the result of an investigation they commissioned. It was called the Singh Investigation and concluded that following in-depth scrutiny of the individual cases provided by Baroness Varsi, alongside the totality of evidence gathered by the investigation, we concluded that allegations of institutional racism against the party were not borne out by the evidence available to the investigation. Baroness Farsi disagreed, asked whether she thought the report cleared the Tory party of institutional Islamophobia. Farsi said this. I think the findings of this report show clearly that the Conservative Party is institutionally racist. And that's based upon the definition of what is institutional racism. But first, in the first inquiry, it was very clear. It defines um, institutional racism as, and I'll quote this, the collective failure of an organisation detected in processes, attitudes and behaviour. And each of those processes, attitudes and behaviour in this particular case and in the findings of this report are found. I mean, the report highlights that, that the party's processes have failed and need an overall haul from policy to strategy to implementation to data collection. There is a, a root and branch um, overhaul being done because the process has failed from attitudes. And we're hearing as part of this report that people are still giving evidence anonymously. They don't feel confident to add their name to the evidence of racism that they're giving. And those that do give evidence, complainants are seen as troublemakers. Behaviour, the report concludes that from the top, from the prime minister at one level, to local associations at the bottom, there is an attitude issue and a problem and a behaviour issue in terms of uh, Islamophobia. So on each of those counts, it satisfies the definition of institutional racism. And, and Beth, you know, the way I see it, if it looks like institutional racism, feels like institutional racism, fits the definition of institutional racism, then I'm afraid it is institutional racism. Ash, I want to bring you in on this. Has Varsi finally been vindicated? I think she has been. One of the problems is that the Islamophobia within the Tory party has been propped up by a series of institutions, which include the EHRC and also the wider political media. Because the kinds of attitudes you see amongst the Tory party membership are indicative of a party which has been essentially radicalised into a state of pervasive anti-Muslim hatred. There was polling conducted by Hope Not Hate. And what it found was that half of the Tory party members surveyed, these are card-carrying Conservative Party members, think that Islam is a threat. You had six in 10 of those uh, surveyed reporting that they believe that in this country, there are no-go zones where non-Muslims cannot tread. And there was other polling conducted which indicated that a fifth of Tory party members self-reported having very negative views of Muslims. And for comparison, there were only 3% of Tory party members reporting that they felt the same way about Hindus, Sikhs, and Jewish people. So we're talking about a culture of pervasive Islamophobia, and it is something which is unfortunately reflected at the level of counsellors. I've had my own experiences of frankly appalling 
attitudes towards racism being expressed directly towards me by a sitting conservative councillor. And then we've seen it repeated on the conservative backbenches and also the ministerial level right up to the prime minister. So that is telling you something about this institution. But you have a consensus, a manufactured consensus amongst the media that this simply isn't very important. When Laura Koonsberg was tweeting about Conservative Party Islamophobia, she referred to it as being on a different political scale, right? Not different political side, scale. So that's doing a lot of work of minimizing the problem. Uh, Philip Collins, when he was still a columnist for The Times, wrote that Labour's racism is worse than the Conservatives. Now, why? On what measure could we say that it's worse? Because one, the Conservatives are in government. So there is the ability for them to action their institutional racism in policy. I personally would argue that the measures in the uh, Borders and Nationality Bill, which create a whole class of second class citizens in this country who can be made stateless if they either have dual nationality or the Home Office can argue that they could have dual nationality. I could fit into that category. Um, That shows you an institutionally racist policy in action. Stripping citizenship from Shamima Begum rather than having her come here to face trial for what she may have done. That is, again, institutional racism in action. The fact that you have MPs like Michael Fabricant, like Nadine Dorries, still retaining the Conservative Party whip after a pattern of Islamophobia, that tells you you have an institutionally racist party. So I don't understand how it was justifiable for anyone in the media to minimize that problem or say that it was lesser, it was less severe, it was on a different political scale to what was going on in Labour. Because if there was polling amongst Labour Party members showing similar attitudes um, being displayed towards any kind of religious or ethnic minority, particularly under Corbyn, it, it would have been, I think, you know, potentially the end of the party, certainly the end of his premiership. When it came to the conservatives and Muslims, it was swept under the rug. And the reason why is because institutional Islamophobia is writ through British society, whether that is government, whether that is media, whether that is how the state functions, how the home office functions, policing, it has passed a level of respectability. And that's why it has been, I think, uh, minimized and dismissed for so long. And it's only become visible because it is politically convenient to recognize it within the context of Boris Johnson's failures as prime minister. 